Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now, to your host, Ken Jakes. Everybody, this is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined in studio by my co-host this week, uh, Kathy Tai. She's the program officer for the Asia Department. How are you doing, Kathy? Good, great. Glad yeah. you're with me. This is the first time you've uh, hosted, uh, co-hosted the podcast yes. with me. Can you scoot in just a little okay, closer sure. to the mic? Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'm, gl- I'm glad better? you better. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. So I, I know you off of uh, off mic, and you're so much fun to work with, and you know the subject matter extremely well, so I'm so happy you're here with us this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. And we are with a China expert this week uh, from uh, – uh, where is Georgia State, by the way? Right in downtown Atlanta. Right in downtown Atlanta. He is professor there. He is Dr. Andrew Wiedemann. Uh, he uh, teaches uh, China Studies. Uh, it, actually, you head the China Studies. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So what is that? Is that a department there, or is it just a program? Or? It's, a, an interdi- it's an interdisciplinary program, part language, part um, business, part social science. Um, it's Right now, it's a minor. It's something if you're majoring in business or political science and you want to have a China angle to it, we offer a set of courses that you can supplement your, uh, your, your, your general focus with. Okay, and you did your Ph.D. at the University of California, right? Uh, UCLA. UCLA, perfect. Sounds like, and how was that? Was that a lot of fun? Oh, California's the promised land. It is, yeah. And where'd you do your under, undergrad at? I did it right here in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. at George Washington University. Terrific. So this is like coming home a little bit for you. Uh, it is home. Um, yeah. I'm actually a, a native Washingtonian. Are you? From oh, here? Yeah. What, what part of the city did you grow up in? Oh, I grew up in uh, Virginia, Maryland, and uh, the district. So all over the place. All over the place. Sounds good. And uh, you've been teaching ever since you got your... Doctorate? Yep. So I uh, started in uh, University of Nebraska in 1994, uh, taught mm-hmm. there until 2012, and then moved to uh, Georgia State. Terrific. And how do you like it down there? It's, uh, it's a real, it's an interesting opportunity. It's a challenge of a university. It's not an elite university. It's a university that really services um, a lot of first-generation students, and in a lot of ways, it's a, uh, it's a gateway out of the blue-collar minimum wage, insecure working class, and into, uh, into uh, white-collar professional work. So, you know, you really feel like you're, uh, you're doing something for uh, your students that, um, you know, is really kind of particularly gratifying. And you're a China expert. Did you do your, your Ph.D. in China studies? or No, my Ph.D. is in political science, political science but right. I have been working on China since the mid-1980s. Okay, so it's been quite a long quite time. A, quite a while. And a lot, a lot of changes have gone on since then? Uh, yeah, when I got into uh, Chinese studies back in the mid-80s, uh, China was poor, underdeveloped, and as a field, it was a backwater. We were overshadowed by the people in the Soviet studies. Uh, people weren't convinced that the Chinese economic experiment was going to work well. Um, it worked. Um, so, you know, China is a radically different place uh, today than well, when I started. That kind of is a perfect segue to my first question for you. Uh, you know, when we think of communism, we, we always looked at the Soviet model uh, here, here, here in the West in the United States. And it seems like the, the Chinese communist model, their economic model is much different, obviously. In, in a lot of ways, a, a lot of uh, lay people here in the United States so look at it as a, as a capitalist type of system in a way. Can you kind of explain to our audience really what their economic system is like, how it's kind of evolved since you got involved in it, which is in the early 80s? Well, they like to call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. The reality is it's capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Um, in the 1980s, they transitioned away from a Badly planned central economy. They grew out of Soviet the plan. Style, in a well, way. the Soviet the Soviet Union actually had centralized planning. Mm-hmm. China never had centralized planning. They had this hodgepodge of local, provincial, national planning, um, never particularly well developed, etc. Which actually proved to be an advantage when they started to open up the economy. In the Soviet Union, you looked at a lot of industries were basically monopolies. Well, in China, they had replicated everything at the provincial level. So China, going into the reform period, had something like 25 provincial car companies. Well, as they began to open up, they'd really, you know, when they, the the reform involved kind of two things. 
One was to open up and to grow a private sector. Today, the private sector has become quite large. The other was to take the state sector and turn it into a marketized state-owned sector in which basically you have state-owned companies that operate in the market. So if you look at the auto industry, for example, there are a series of major uh, state-owned companies that compete with each other essentially in the same way that General Motors, Ford, uh, uh, compete in the United States. So when you look at the Chinese economy today, it's, it's neither a planned economy nor a fully marketized economy. State companies remain powerful. They dominate certain industries. The state owns most of the, uh, the banks, controls most of the flow of capital. So it is, it's, it's, it's a hybrid economy. And yet many of those state companies operate very much in the same way that publicly held companies in the United States uh, operate. They're, you know, they're, they're joint stock companies. State owns some of the stock. Some of the stock is traded on either the Shanghai or Shenzhen stock exchange. They operate on, the pro um, on a profit basis. But if things don't go well, well, then they turn to the state. And the state will bail them out in a way that you would not find in the United States. You had mentioned the, the stock market over there. Uh, a little over a year ago, we held an event at the National Press Club, uh, an event that I moderate. I, I was, I'm a former reporter with CNN, and I invited uh, Jim Shuto, who's the national security mm -hmm. uh, correspondent for CNN, to join. He was also the chief of staff to, I can't remember his name, he, he was the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to China at the time. John Hansman? Uh, no, it, this was during Obama, um, but I can't remember his name. Anyway. Uh, so he's, he's a China expert. He lived a couple of years over there. He took a hiatus from, from journalism. I believe he was at, with uh, NBC. Uh, he was the London correspondent, I believe. Uh, and then he went to China and then came back and, and joined CNN. But he was talking about uh, problems with transparency and, and es especially in the stock market because you, you don't know what the economic indicators are, 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 are really like. You don't know if they're, they're true, they're false. Uh, so explain a little bit about transparency in the country and then we can get into more of what we really want to talk about today, but that's corruption in China, which you're an expert. You've written several books on that. Um, transparency is a chronic problem because, you know, you really, to have a functioning stock market, you need to know what the financial state of the company is. You also need to know who the major stockholders are. You need to know who's on the board, et cetera. Um, the, the Chinese, it, it, you know, the Chinese state, in effect, understands that you need these things yet they don't want to reveal things that they don't want to get why out. Why is that? Um, it's because partly they're covering things up from, you know, investors. Partly they're covering it up from the state. You know, they want to cover up the state. You know, if, if they're losing money, they want to cover that up. If they're making money, well, maybe they don't want to tell you how much they're making. Are they protecting their own financial interests? Uh, well, they're, pro they're protecting the interests of the company. And you have to understand that... You know, we call them state-owned companies, but the reality is, like a publicly held co uh, company here, they're actually owned by the state but controlled by management. Mm -hmm. So management may well be doing things to disguise the financial health of the company from the state itself, uh -huh. so that maybe they're taking more in bonuses, maybe they're socking money away here, maybe they're taking corporate funds and making private investments with it. So... You know, you have an element of transparency being a problem with Chinese companies, but then you also have a problem with the Chinese stock market is that it's, it's you know, people are speculating. They're looking to make money fast. It's a kind of pump and dump kind of operation. And a lot of the investors themselves are investing kind of blindly, hoping that there's some sucker who will pay even more for the stock uh, two days down the road. So it's a combination of transparency and speculation. I myself do not invest in the Chinese stock market. So. For, for the above reasons you just yeah. mentioned. Exactly. So what is the dynamic? How, how is the play between the state managers and the, the, the managers of the corporation? Uh, you, you, you said that there's a lot of you know, fixing figures and things like that to protect themselves because of lower profits than they want to show, that type of thing. What kind of penalties could they get for if, if they got caught? Well, uh, they're state officials. The managers of these companies they're, are state, they're, they're, they they're are state, state officials, right. and they are subject to the same disciplinary 
punishments that a, a regular official would be. So how does that work? What's the hierarchy in terms of the government? Say, say you have a, a, a public utility or, mm -hmm. or oil company or what have you. You have state officials that, 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 are, that are on their board or manage, manage the company. Then who, who are their bosses? Who are, who are the ones that oversee them? Who are their supervisors? Well, typically the company, you know, t most of the major companies have now turned into stock companies. And the state will own stock, but who owns holds that stock is a state holding company gotcha. with a board of its own staffed by state officials. People go back and forth from the state-owned enterprises to the government they move back and forth, so you can be the the man, you could be the general manager of the Chinese National Petroleum Company, and then you move over and you're the minister of public security. Um, they I usually see a lot of yeah. problems with that type of stuff. Um, <laughs> yes, but as such, they are state officials. So if they do things, for example, if you're the manager of a company and you're cutting a deal with the manager of another company, and they offer you a kickback. You're subject to the, the laws on bribery, just as if you were a official and you told someone, if you want this contract, I need so much money. Um, in some ways, that complicates things, because things that occur in the United States that end up being corporate white-collar crime, not corruption, in China are actually corruption. So the, in effect, you know, the, the field or the, the set of people subject to the laws on corruption in China is actually larger than in the United States. And in some cases, a high level of corruption, they, they even execute people, don't they? Uh, I don't think they have executed anyone since 2007. So it's been a while. And that was a case where they executed the head of the Food and Drug Administration. He had failed to discipline his subordinates, and he was clearly a sacrificial lamb. They they still hand down a lot of what they call a death sentence with two year reprieve, uh -huh. and what it is it's a suspended death sentence. You for two years have the death sentence hanging over your head. If you behave, if you cooperate, it's then commuted to life. Um, once it's commuted to life, then you actually are eligible for parole, etc. Um, so the but ones they, they, have, act they actually haven't executed anyone for corruption for about a decade. For about a decade, but when they do clamp down on corruption, they, it can be pretty severe. We talk about life sentences. Uh, yeah. C sentences in China are considerably more severe in the United States. In general, for public uh, corruption in, in the United States, the most you're going to get is 18 months. Yeah. Uh, they hand down 10, 12, 13, 14, 18, 20 years on up to life, and then this you know, two-year death sentence. So the penalties in China are actually much more severe. And how selective are they are in prosecuting the cases? Well, the, you would have to know what they didn't prosecute, and of course that's impossible, it's impossible. to know. Well, what, what's, what's your speculation on that? Um, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a guess that is very hard to guess. Uh, what percentage do they c catch? I, I really have no clear sense because we have no way. We know how many people they catch, but we don't know how many people are corrupt. And that figure is unknowable and if i was to give a guess of it it would be it would nothing be inaccurate more than, it would yeah, yeah it would just be a pure guess but is it fair to say that corruption is a massive problem in, in china i would call it a major problem okay um the one thing that we need to keep in mind is if you look at the international rankings china does is not in the worst quarter quartile it's somewhere along that border it's among that 50 percent in the middle right in the middle we think corruption's particularly bad in China, <coughs> excuse me, in part because we read a lot about it. Why do we read a lot about it? Because they're cracking down on corruption. Why do we know about high-level corruption in the Politburo? It's because they actually arrest people. Um, if you look at a lot of really corrupt countries, there's a lot of sense of corruption. There's not a lot of prosecution. Right. But in this uh, recent campaign, this last five years, uh, Two million members of the Communist Party have been investigated either for corruption or what they call official extravagance. <coughs> a quarter of a million people have been indicted on corruption charges. <coughs> it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's a big country. Um, so China's corrupt, but China is fighting corruption, which in some ways sets it apart from other countries. Like, like Russia.
for example, uh, because there, you know, <coughs> I mean, it, it's it's commonly held that it's a very corrupt country. Although they do have uh, prosecutions there, but it's usually after Putin's political opponents, generally speaking. And that leads me to my next question: Is how much of this is politically motivated in in, in China, or is it really is a an honest attempt to, to crack down on corruption? It's not an either or. Okay. Um, if you look at it, most of the people being prosecuted are rank and file, mid-level officials. So they're men management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are not part of the political game. They are political in the sense that the regime needs to show the public that it's mm. willing to fight corruption. So there is a political element to it. But when you talk about politics, essentially what you're saying is, this a, is this a factional fight? Right. Well, as I said earlier, about 150 people, civilian officials, uh, somewhere between 80 and 100 military officers, have been implicated, have been prosecuted, have been convicted, or still under investigation uh, since 2012. Of those, if you actually go out and look at the connections, how many people are linked to those central figures? Probably five, six hundred out of a quarter million. So there is a, there is an element at the top which is political, but political in the sense of, you know, was this a factional battle? Was Xi Jinping, when he came into office, faced with um, a series of factional rivals? I don't get the sense. Most mm -hmm. of these people, even the most senior ones, appear to be more interested to have been more interested in plunder uh, illegal gain than they were in politics so the most prominent figure taken out was a man named Zhou Yang Kang he had been the head of the Chinese National Petroleum Company Minister of Public Security party secretary of Sichuan which is a big province in the West and that he'd been a member of the Politburo Standing Committee and also the head of a very powerful committee that controlled the sec internal security apparatus he was due to retire in 2012. Um, he was not a rival to Xi Jinping. But when evidence emerged that he and a lot of people around him were corrupt, Xi Jinping was handed a golden opportunity. And what, I, kind, of, what kind of corruption are we talking about? Uh, mostly bribery, bribery. Okay. Um, some embezzlement, uh, largely dealing with the buying and selling of contracts, uh, mineral exploration rights, et cetera. Um, you know, not, not wholesale plunder in the sense that they're looting the treasury. They're out there taking advantage of their political power to, to leverage uh, income. Now, we talked a little bit before how the structure of their economic system is set up. Does the way it's set up lend itself more to corruption than you would if you had just a, a, a more pure market economy? Oh, certainly. Um, for one, I mean, these people control or are able to manipulate state-owned companies and, you know, extract uh, payments from, you know, vendors, from contractors, suppliers, etc. Um, a lot of big money is made um, through things like the approval of uh, IPOs. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a regulator and you come in and you say, I'd like to, you know, take my company public, I'd be fine. Well, here's a pile of paperwork. Uh, you come back with that, and I can find lots of errors. Or perhaps you, um, you you sell some of the stock before the IPO to my wife or to my son, or you hire my cousin, and uh, the paperwork will go through much more uh, much more smoothly. Catherine, uh, you had a couple questions you wanted to ask me. Right. So for the past few years, Chinese economy has fueled by uh, a lot of investment, especially in the infrastructure and construction uh, sector. And there is uh, also a high profile uh, scandal uh, involved uh, with uh, the Minister of uh, Railway uh, in China. Would you mind uh, talking a little bit about this and then how uh, this incident might have some implication overseas with uh, similar Chinese investments? Well, uh, you know, when the, um, when the international economy tanked in 2008, uh, China quickly responded with a bailout. Uh, they were faced with the prospect of rapidly falling orders for exports. The economy had been uh, reliant but not totally dependent on export-led growth. Uh, the Chinese government responded with a major stimulus package 
And one of the areas they pumped money into was infrastructure. It's easy to, to uh, you know, prime the pump by building highways, airports, and high-speed rail. Um, the high-speed rail development was already underway. They uh, accelerated uh, spending on it. Uh, the Minister of uh, Railways um, was skimming off a percentage. He was working through a woman uh, broker who, if you wanted a contract uh, for high-speed rail, you paid her and she in turn paid him. Um, it led to some shoddy construction. There was a major accident back in 2011 involving a high-speed rail, um, a true scandal in that, you know, the, the local responders were slow to get on the thing. They allegedly searched the cars only to find a, a young child had been left behind. And um, almost immediately they started digging ditches so they could bury the cars. Uh, well, everyone in China knew what they were doing was burying the evidence. Um, actually, this is one of the precipitating uh, the triggers for the 2013 to present anti-corruption campaign. I think Xi Jinping looked at the amount of, uh, amount of corruption involved in this infrastructure uh, program and, you know, felt a real need to crack down. Um, you know, one of the things that if you're trying to convince the public that you're spending their money wisely, train crashes, bridges that fall down, faulty construction becomes a, a very glaring evidence of, of uh, corruption. Um, corruption in public infrastructure spending is not uniquely Chinese. It's a global problem. And of course, in recent years, um, the Chinese have been pushing the One Belt, One Road program. This is a program to build major transportation infrastructure around the world to help China be able to penetrate into other areas and to facilitate trade. Well, Chinese companies will be behind many of these projects. Chinese money will be behind many of these projects. And undoubtedly, this will help export corruption from China. But let's be frank, many of the countries they're going into have their own, have, have, they have plenty of experience being corrupt themselves. Do you have a couple examples that you can give us? Uh, we, we talked before the show, especially in, in, in South Asia, in a couple countries. Well, uh, you know, the money really hasn't started flowing. Um, but we do see plenty of corruption involving particularly oil contracts uh, in Angola, in Kazakhstan, etc. cetera. Um, you know, as, again, this is the, the Chinese are not inventing corruption in these areas. What they're simply doing is pumping more money into it. As you pump more money into so it, of course, influence. you yeah. yeah. But you also get more corruption as a result. Exactly, and I, and I mentioned earlier an example was in Ghana, where there I think it was a rail system where I, I think the the contract was for about five between five and six billion dollars, and they did an audit afterwards and found that the, the contract was really worth about seven hundred million dollars. So there was there was a lot tacked on, which obviously means there's a lot of corruption going on. Well, and how much of the tack on was Chinese and how much was, was Ghanaian? Exactly. Uh, Ghana, Nigeria, et cetera, are infamous. They've been doing That's this right. for years. Uh, the fact that the Chinese may ask fewer questions than the World Bank and USAID uh, means that the, probably the percentage is larger. Um, the Chinese undoubtedly raked some of it off, but I'm sure their local partners 100%. raked off plenty. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how does this model of development uh, – how does it compete with, with the, the U.S. model? I mean, uh, do, do they have an advantage because they're working in countries that have similar types of corrupt models? Well, American companies would, of course, say that they're absolutely shackled by the Foreign That's Corrupt right. Practices yeah. Act, that they can't buy, you know, they can't buy prospective clients meals or even a cup of coffee, whereas the Chinese come in and, you know, it's... You know, wheel and deal. And wheel and deal, and... Um, it's true to a certain extent. The Chinese companies themselves are actually subject to a similar set of provisions. It is actually illegal for a Chinese company to pay bribes overseas. Um, there have been a number of prosecutions. Uh, they're not large. It's clear that they don't enforce it very well. But you have to keep in mind, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was passed in, 19, in the 1970s. That's right. Really was not 
because it really did not become an active statute till about 10 years ago yeah. well when you see the uptick you in know. a convention with the OECD I think it was 20 years ago so there was different right. and then, levels of that so right but the the it really wasn't till the Obama administration well, that really they started really started yeah. enforcing it and really putting in you know the the things to to go after American companies before that it was you know here are the rules and here are the rules. Here are the rules. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's it, that that level of enforcement on the U.S. side is new, but the reality is is if you're really going to tackle corruption, mm -hmm. you not only have to c tackle what I call the supply side, which is corrupt officials, you got to tackle the demand side, and and you know it's quite enlightening is to look at the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act prosecutions in the United States. And in a lot of the judgments, they'll tell you how much was paid in bribes and then how much the company had to disgorge in illegal profits. The ratio on average was seven to one. Mm. A seven to one investment, in other words, you invest one dollar in corruption, in a bribe, and you get seven dollars back in profit. I'm a political scientist, I'm not an economist, I'm not a uh, Wall Street banker, but I think seven to one is a pretty good return. So the trick is you've got to you've got to you've got to crack down on the bribe payers as well as the bribe takers. Right, Kathy, you have some more questions. Uh, I'm just uh, curious as to uh, you know in China the anti-corruption campaign has been going on for a few years and um, has there any improvement in terms of setting up new monetary mechanism to prevent uh, more bribery or corrupt practices from happening? Well. It's not a few years. The uh, the current war on corruption in China began in 1982, uh, so you know it's 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 a it's a very long term process. Um, you have to understand when the war began, they had a rudimentary criminal law, they had rudimentary monitoring and monitoring and forces. There was no there was no criminal law in China until 1979. Um, everything was done by the seat of the commissar's pants. They've tightened, they've tightened, they've tried things, uh, they have things in place, you know, they have an asset uh, disclosure law, but nobody checks it, it's not public, it's not transparent, um, and for reasons that, you know, they don't want to necessarily make everything public. The, the thing I would say is, you know, China began fighting corruption back in the 80s. If you look at the United States, we had a corruption problem in the 19th century. Uh, particularly after the Civil War. We started fighting it in the 1880s. Real progress wasn't made until the 1920s and the 1930s, and we still have a problem in the United States. You know, the China, you know, when I go to China, uh, people ask me, well, what should we do to solve our corruption problem? What's the silver bullet? There is no silver bullet. You've got to start fighting it. Every time you put a regulation in, people will try to game the system. You've got to figure, every time you put in a rule and they game it, you've got to figure out how to counter the game. It's a long-term process, and it's a long-term process because you're not just talking about the institutional talking mechanism about, of the cultural change. Yeah. It's, you know, if you've come into a system that's corrupt, the way you get ahead is to get, play the game the way they do. Um, if you're a mid-level person, you may well have climbed up as a result of you know, paying bribes for promotions, et cetera. You've got to start early on. You've got to start in school. You can't have your parents paying, giving gifts and paying to small bribes yep. to get you good grades, to get yep. you sitting, seated in the front. If you learn that's the way to get ahead in elementary school, by the time and you're an official. that's not Chinese thing. That's uh, in a lot of developing yeah, worlds. And My wife is from the Republic of Georgia. In, in the Soviet period, uh, they, they gave, bottles of wine and different things to teachers to kick their grades up. So this, this happens all over the world. Yeah, and it, again, it's a cultural thing. If you learn Not it as Georgia a child. Not Georgia State, though. Well, we got no money. There's no money at Georgia State. <laughs> There's no bribe um, money. You know, $5 <laughs> will buy you a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, that's that's neither here nor there. Um, it is a, it's a long-term fight, and what you're fighting is human nature. Yep. You know, human nature, if you think you can get away with it, you know, why not? Why not take that ten dollars, that twenty dollars? Um, so you know, China's China's fighting. China's trying. Uh, it's a process. It's a process. 
Um, of course, there are constraints, political constraints, that the party, you, you can't fight corruption too hard because if you fight corruption too hard, you may expose things you don't want exposed. But I will, I will say that, you know, corruption, bad as it is in China, it's not out of control. Um, it's not spiraling out of control, and that's because, beginning in the 80s, they recognized they had a problem. And what they was fight the it. impetus to that in the 80s? What, 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 was there an event that happened? What, what, what happened? Um, there was no single event. And it, it, the, the reality is the Maoist era was in some ways at least as corrupt as the current era. Mm -hmm. But in the Maoist era, it wasn't money. You had an economy of scarcity. Everything was in short supply. Bribes in the Maoist era were denominated in cartons of cigarettes, in kilos of pork, bolts of cotton, bottles of Chinese liquor, etc. Well, beginning in the 80s, the good old bottle of Chinese Baijo had been replaced by the case of Johnny Walker. Um, it was becoming more and more of, you know, monetized, etc. Um, the party also in the early 80s was going through a rectification. They were trying to clear out people who had been leftists during the Cultural Revolution who had committed various political offenses. And as they did so, they became aware that, you know, corruption was a pervasive issue. Deng Xiaoping decided in 82 they needed an anti-corruption campaign. 89 student demonstrations led to a major anti-corruption campaign. So they're aware of it. They're working on it. It's a process. And they will be working on it for years to come. Exactly. Andrew, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, 30, I think we were, what, 35 minutes already? 31. So it went by quickly, as, as oh, we, of course. we thought. Kathy, thanks so much for coming in. It was a lot of fun. Thank Hope you. Hope you can uh, join me again soon. Yep, for so, sure. So, Andrew, thanks. Uh, where can people get more information about what you're doing? Um, they can go to the Georgia State Political Science website. And I, they have a page for me, and my email is there. And if they're really fascinated, you can drop me an email. Great. Thanks so much for coming in. This was a lot of fun. All right. See you next week. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at sipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.